Hello, welcome to History and Lowell. I'm Maritza Grooms, and I'm here with Bob for it. You're also preparing for a bunch of walks and tours yep. and all kinds of things because now we have nice weather it's finally. summer season. Yes. yes. Yep. And that's when I get to do my summer learning. <laughs> no, I like being outside, so being able to do history walks in Lowell is actually a, yes. a pretty amazing thing to do because you're right in the, you're right in it all. Yeah. And so no matter where you walk, you can see something. And I feel like it's more memorable too, right? Because I'm a visual learner, so to see mm -hmm. the w in the way that you describe things on your walks, it's just so rich and brings so much to life, and it makes you remember more, I think, too. Yeah. And you kind of feel that history a little bit more. Exactly, and I think that if you look at a building and you know what it signified at a particular time in the city's history, you have a different appreciation oh, for that for sure. particular building than just kind of walking by it and shrugging. Yeah, you see <laughs> it through a new lens, right? right? Yep, yeah, absolutely. So what lens are we putting on today? We're focusing in on something, right? So the focus today, it's a topic we covered, but we covered it two years ago when we first started yes. doing these shows. And <laughs> so it seemed appropriate to take a revisit, is thinking about the city and the city's history and relationship to the institution of slavery. Mm and as well the very dynamic and progressive history going on at the same time, which was the fact that Lowell had a very vibrant anti-slavery movement. So these two cotton coming in from the labor of enslaved people in the South, and at the same time this very vibrant movement against the institution of slavery. So it's a really, again, yeah. one of these things when you walk around you can just imagine the clash of the titans as people are, oh, you know, yeah. it's like the Avengers part five or something. <laughs> Um, <laughs> trying to figure out how you deal with yeah. the, the history. Yeah, and I feel like in Lowell, we always talk about um, the role of the labor workers here in abolition, but we don't talk about how it's directly, like what they were producing, why these industries were even here, and where that, how that all connects to slavery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and <laughs> it, it stands to reason, right? Lowell is famous for when people come to the National Park or they come to the Songus Industrial History Center or students studying about the history of Lowell. No Lowell is a cotton mill city. But it's not too often that then people who are t either teaching it and or walking around and thinking about it actually then make that connection because we think of the institution of slavery as being far away. It's mm -hmm. like someplace down south. And so it really doesn't have anything to do with us. And yet it's, it's obviously overly simplistic because right. how the hell did the cotton get here? Exactly. It's um, inextricably linked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I like that. Inextricably. Yeah. It's <laughs> inextricably linked. And, and you fail to adequately tell the story of the city. And much in the same way, I think, that now lots of colleges and universities, particularly mm -hmm. the older ones, the Ivy Leagues and like Georgetown and Washington DC and other places are sort of revisiting their own histories as mm. institutions of so-called higher learning and yet at the same time those institutions either owned um, people and or were, were receivers of philanthropy from mm. people who made their fortune on the slave trade. Yeah. And so as they're sort of peeling back and re-looking at that, I've always felt like we should be doing that in Lowell. And it's mm. not to say, you know, Lowell is responsible for the institution of slavery. Of course it's not, but on the other hand, the city benefited from the fact that it yeah. existed. And to not be honest about that just seems, you know, it's just, it's silly, it's wrong, and, it, and it's also pernicious in a way because yeah. it, it discounts an important part of that history which we should be aware of when we're, yeah. when we're walking around Lowell. And to not acknowledge it means that you're, um, no pun intended, you're whitewashing um, <laughs> a really important part of history. Yeah, although I do really love that as a pun. <laughs> <laughs> because okay. I feel, uh, is that a thing that you see often as a historian? like? history getting whitewashed in yeah, on all those sure. levels? Sure, I mean, I think that, you know, in particular, women have been left out of history, and right. so, I don't know if you could, cut that's female washed or something, I don't <laughs> know what, I don't know what the, the corresponding <laughs> metaphor would be, but, you know, when, when you talk about Lowell, sort of in general, 
um, women are a major portion of the workforce when mm -hmm. the mills are built, and everybody's eager to talk about the mill girls. Right. Um, but after 1860, the mill girls, in that formal sense, um, aren't the majority workforce, mm -hmm. but it's immigrant women that are working, and they, their story's not told. Right. And so you go and read, which I've been doing for the last six months, oral histories of those women, and you realize they're not surprisingly working a double shift. They work in the mill all day and then go home and cook and clean and take care of the children. Imagine that, they're humans? Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> right? But they're discounted, so when the story of the mills is told, it's just like magically there's now a male workforce, mm. and the women disappear from the history. And so in the same way that, you know, looking at this before the Civil War history of Lowell, that certain things just because they're uncomfortable mm. um, get left out. And that, that's a big problem that I see I'm doing a lot of work now thinking about historical memory. Mm. So the idea of what do we, what gets remembered, what gets told, and why yeah. and how that matters, and why if you leave this portion of what we're talking about today out of the equation, you miss being able to tell an important story. And the same way if we discount women from the story mm -hmm. or, you know, or particular immigrant groups we leave off, or we tell the immigrant history of Lowell, but we stop at a particular point in history, yeah. uh, and we don't cover sort of what's been happening since, say, 1970. Right. And so we kind of stop the story at, Portu at the last wave of Portuguese immigration, mm -hmm. and we leave out subsequent 50 years of, of immigration history. <laughs> and, you know, and I think sometimes people do it not out of evil intent. Right. Um, sometimes it's just easier. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's definitely easier to leave out things that make one uncomfortable. Yeah. And so, again, sort of telling a story about the institution of slavery, the slave trade, how much that benefited Lowell, it can be an uncomfortable story for people that want to tell a more celebratory history of, right. wow, this is the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. And, and you know, look at all this innovation, and these guys came and built these machines and did all this stuff. I mean, all that's true, and I teach yeah. industrial history, and so I know it's true. But wait, there's a corollary here. There's a parallel mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I just feel like my, I mean, part of my work as a historian is to figure out, I'm always trying to understand what got left out. Yeah. And how come. And then what do we do about it? I That's love that. It's like, like I, you know, I, I'm a nag, I guess. <laughs> I'm a historian <laughs> nag. No, you're, you're an investigator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it is investigation, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, it brings to mind um, a quote from Hamilton, of course, um, who lives, who dies, who tells your story. And mm -hmm. I think it's important that um, when we're talking about history, all the whole story gets told, right? Or I, I think of kids when they get in trouble, you know, there's always my side, your side. Yep. and the real what happened. And, no, so. and then all sides are supposedly equal. E yeah. Which isn't necessarily true either. Exactly. I mean, other people, you know, when, I'm tra when I was trained to be a historian, sort of saying was, you know, history belongs to the victors. Mm, yes. Right? And so yes. whoever, whoever wins gets to tell the story the way they want to tell it. And exactly. that's, that's also superficial and incomplete. I mean, and the other thing about this issue of the institution of slavery is if you grow up around here, you somewhat think, well, s there was no slavery in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Wrong. Yeah. There was slavery in Massachusetts. There was slavery throughout the North mm -hmm. until well into the 18th century. Um, and, you know, there was a census, for example, I have some numbers in front of me. There was a census done um, in 1754 to count how many enslaved people there were wow. in Massachusetts. And Middlesex County had about 400 people, Suffolk County, 1,200, that's ba Greater Boston, mm -hmm. um, and Essex County, the North Shore these days, is, had about 450 people. Wow. And the numbers would have been higher if it had been done in 1720 or 1730, but as the 18th century progressed, people were either freeing the kids of um, the, the people that they owned, or mm -hmm. as people passed away, they weren't replaced by then another enslaved person and so it was so unlike the south where the numbers over this period of time are growing almost exponentially that's yeah. not what's happening but it takes a while i mean it's not 
you know, it's not until the 1780s that the New England states, one at a time, yeah. you know, relinquished the fact that the institution's legal. And, and like in a case like Massachusetts, and we think, oh my God, Massachusetts, like we just, <laughs> we just think of it as this very liberal yeah. place, but that's where the 21st century lands. Oh my goodness. Not the case, right? Yeah. So, and then again, the, those folks in Suffolk County and greater Boston, um, Beacon Hill as a good example, the top part of Beacon Hill, for people who are familiar with that area of Boston where the State House is, mm -hmm. and across the top, and then the hill as it slopes down to where Boston Common is, that was where really wealthy people lived. Mm -hmm. And most of them owned people to oh. take care of them, to cook for them, to clean for them, to walk their kids around the neighborhood, to be nannies and whatever, and you know to make sure the fires were lit in the morning and all of that stuff. And that large um, African population lived on the other s on the other side of Beacon Hill, the side that slopes down to oh, where yeah. like Mass General Hospital is mm -hmm. now. And that was a very large community. And that's also where lots of people who were escaping the South mm. on the Underground Railroad ended up living. They ended up living in that very dense neighborhood wow. where the fact that there were so many people living there who were African they could hide, in pl if you will, in plain sight, wow. as opposed to s being in a community where there might only be three people. Yeah. And it would be obvious when you were walking around, like, who are you? Um, and so they would literally hide in plain sight in this very vibrant neighborhood on the backside <laughs> of Beacon Hill, That's while so each morning wild. they would walk over the hill and, and work for really rich Get white people, out basically. Of here. Wow. Uh, uh, so, for viewers who don't know, I grew up in Boston. That's the thing that I never learned about. And I'm, I guess I can't really say I'm curious as to why, because that's what we're sure. talking about today, right? Yep. So, let's get uncomfortable. Let's dig into it. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm digging. Yeah, who <laughs> else were, because it wasn't just Africans who were slaves, right? Didn't we have some indigenous folks who were also? So, there were, but not, but that's pretty much withered away by this mm. point, late in the 18th century. There are also people who were coming in the late 1600s and the early 1700s who could be indentured. Mm. Um, but being an indentured servant, I mean, you weren't technically called a slave. Right. And right. so this was a way to differentiate so it looked like mm. you were bet well, at least I'm not a slave. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, and so just again, another one of these ways to fragment, fracture, make people mm. be against each other. Well, you know, at least I'm not you. <laughs> um, and. But typically, if you came that way, it was for a set number of years, mm -hmm. and then you would be basically free and walking around. Yeah. Um, whereas in the, as the 17th century progresses into the 18th century, um, states begin to pass laws to make it more difficult for even Africans who might be freed mm. to actually really be free. So there are things like pass laws, where if you're trying to move from town to town, you need to have papers that say you're okay to be moving mm. from this place to that. There are lots of laws, local laws and custom, that um, you're not supposed to be out after dark. Yeah. And just sort of, there's this whole sort of s set of strictures around um, just living as a free person, even once you may have either been in indentured and now you're free, or you are, you know, you, you had been enslaved and maybe your owner at a certain point gave you your freedom and now you're trying to live a life, but you're mm -hmm. still sort of circumscribed by your color to be identified. And so, you know, it's like now we talk about driving while black or yeah. walking while black. Well, this was the same way. It wasn't driving because there was no car, but it yeah. was walking or being in a wagon, you know, while black. You would be stopped. Show me your papers. Are you free or what have you? And if you... <laughs> You even, and s even if you had papers, if somebody wanted to take you, they would take you because mm. you had no standing in the courts. So even if you said, wait, no, I'm free. My papers are at home. Yeah. By the time somebody figured out that you might have been taken um, illegally in that way, you're now on a ship and you're heading back to Charleston, oh. South Carolina or to Alabama or to Mississippi, never to be seen again. 
Yeah. It's sort of like now ice coming and snatching. Yeah. It's a similar phenomenon. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Yeah, no, it's very, I could see yeah. where your brain was yeah. going there. <laughs> We've <laughs> like, done this enough times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, but yeah, it's oh, very similar. Yeah. yeah, no, very, the dynamic is somewhat similar yeah. in terms of, you know, the sort of, and so of course then people would be, um, and rightly so, afraid necessarily to mm -hmm. be out at after dark or to leave again in the example of the backside of Beacon Hill, yeah. the Cambridge Street side, you know, okay, well, I'm good in here, but I'm not going to walk up across the yeah. top Mount Vernon Street or whatever and be like on the downside. Or, and I don't want to be in the common yeah. um, at dusk because <laughs> who knows what's going to happen. I feel like people still feel like that about the common. <laughs> <laughs> For different reasons, yeah. maybe, I don't know, <laughs> but yeah. But so, so in, in, so Lowell per se, Mm -hmm. does not ever have enslaved people living in it because there is no such thing as Lowell until the 1820s, right. um, technically speaking. And by that point, the institution is illegal in the Commonwealth. So it's not like we can go around and say this is where people live, but Drake at Chelmsford back in the day, there were small numbers of uh, enslaved people mm -hmm. in those towns in the 17, this 1754 census shows those numbers for a number of wow. those towns. So people can, if they're curious, you can, that's an easy researchable thing to find and see the numbers um, of cities and towns all over the Commonwealth. However, the link to Lowell, the really clear link, of course is the cotton later, but in the founding of what becomes Lowell, the money, the mm -hmm. investor dough that basically begins to construct the canals and put the dams up on the, on the Merrimack and build the brick buildings and all of that. Mm -hmm. That wealth accumulates from participation in the slave trade. Mm. And this is the thing that people just take for granted and they don't, they don't, and people never ask where the money is coming from. Right. That's always my first question. Show me uh, the money. Exactly. Show I want to know money tree. where is it going? The yeah. money trail. Where is it coming from? Where is it going? Um, I actually did an activity with the girls recently about community power and we, inadvertently learned about distribution of wealth. Uh -huh. And they could clearly point out the communities in Lowell that have a little bit more wealth than the places sure. that they're from. Yep. Um, so to know that even still we're perpetuating that separation mm -hmm. with money that, again, where is this money coming from? Yep. Where is this wealth coming from? Yeah, and we, I mean, when I was a kid, I was taught, I grew up in Beverly, so I was taught in the Beverly Public Schools, and we learned all about the magic of the triangular trade. Mm. And like the fact that one uh, one leg of the trade was people, just was sort of treated as well. Rum went here, and cod went there, and lumber went there, and people came there, <laughs> and just sort of like. And this is, and it was taught in just this very matter of fact mm -hmm. way. And so we were supposed to memorize what product flowed which way, and the people that were part of this were just seen as a product, as yeah. a as a part, right? But again. The in, mass in the U.S., when the Constitution is signed, there's a clause that says in the early 1800s, slave trade will no longer be legal. Mm. And so those folks now think, okay, what are we, we going to make our money? Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? Because we can't do this anymore. This has been pretty lucrative. But um, we can try to skirt the law, which some people obviously do, of and course. do it anyway. Um, or we have an internal trade in people from state to state or mm. whatever as the country begins to grow. But this set of characters basically says, okay, well now we'll get in on the ground floor in manufacturing. Sort of, again, yeah. your Hamilton reference, that's what Hamilton and Jefferson are arguing about yeah. for much of the late 18th, early 19th century. Are we going to manufacture or not? And this collection of people, largely based in Boston, which made all their money on the so-called triangular trade, now say, okay, we're gonna start manufacturing. And they basically have the money to build mills first in Waltham and then eventually in what becomes Lowell. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, and like reeling over here. like, And then what happens after to the bodies? What happens after to the money? And does mm -hmm. it ever come back to <laughs> well, we know, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's actually <laughs> something going on now with students at Georgetown where they're yeah. demanding reparations because in the last 16, 18 months or so, 
it's become much clearer in the history of Georgetown that the institution as an institution had base had owned people and then when they mm -hmm. looked like they might go into debt they sold people off and they broke up families and sold people off and did what other people you know not just Georgetown did this other places as well right. and the students as they've uncovered this story are saying wait we need to figure out okay who were those people yeah. what happened to the families how do we figure out how to trace this and then what do we do about it and we now that we know this we can't just shrug Exactly. Once and you so, know better, you have yeah. to do better. I mean, the same things happened at Brown, at mm. Yale, at Harvard. And so these more, what we would think of as elite institutions, have done this. But by the same token, communities that benefited in the way that Lowell did, they haven't necessarily done the same. Yeah. And so part of me and other people trying to work on all of this is to is to look at it. And the thing is that it's an important history because, okay, so that's how the money got here, that's how the mills got built, mm -hmm. but yet by the 1830s, there's a very vital, very lively, very provocative anti-slavery movement in the city yeah. parallel to the development of the mills. And so while on the one side you've got that story of where the wealth came from and how it built the city, on the other side you've got a collection of heroic, pretty heroic people in my mind mm. saying, wait, this is not, you know, this is something we're opposed to. This is something that, yeah. that shouldn't continue. We want an end to slavery in the United States. And they're very actively engaged in that process. And Lowell becomes one of the most important places simply because of this interconnection. Yeah. And the fact, you know, and Southern planters are very upset that Lowell supports this anti-slavery activity. And at one point there's this interesting article in a Southern newspaper where they talk about, well maybe we ought to teach Lowell a lesson um, and not buy any of the products that are made in Lowell anymore oh, until, they, until they ban the existence of anti-slavery societies in Lowell. Wow. And they basically say we should boycott law because <laughs> in, a, in a sort of, again, think of this, right, this very cynical sort of dynamic. Enslaved people produced the cotton in the South that could ships to Lowell. Mm -hmm. Lowell turns it into cloth. One of the biggest customers for that cloth are the plantations mm -hmm. to use the rough cloth that gets produced here yeah. back for, for clothing for enslaved people. So you stand a good chance as you're picking that cotton to be actually wearing a pair of trousers or a shirt uh. that might have been made but you know might have been produced from the cotton that you picked or that your grandmother or grandfather picked or mm -hmm. maybe your kids or whatever. And so I mean Massachusetts again this link right Lynn Massachusetts which is a major place making boots and shoes yeah. major customer southern <laughs> plantations. Oh my gosh. Right, so we have, we in New England, but particularly in greater Lowell area, um, Eastern Massachusetts, whatever you want to call it, are again sort of connected in this very dynamic way. And there are mill overseers in Lowell who are writing letters, which the Songus Industrial History Center found. You know, we're there basically telling the southern planters, you know, you may hear that there's crazy abolitionists here in Lowell, but don't worry, we've got them under control. Wow. Um, so, you know, <laughs> even though you're reading that this is happening, we got your, basically s saying we got your back. Don't worry about it. And to some extent, they kind of did have that control because they're controlling the wages and the hours of yep. some of these workers who are also speaking out. But it's so bizarre because they're like, at least we're doing the bare minimum. We're letting them circulate these petitions. Mm -hmm. We're letting them right. think that they're also free, but we're still maintaining that mm -hmm. control. Yeah, and they would, so again, what's strange in the history, the more you uncover, so the mill complex where, um, where LTC is, um, you know, was a place that produced a lot of cotton textiles, rugs, yeah. other things, right, using cotton. And one of the initial mill overseers in this complex where we're sitting right now uh, was a Quaker. Oh. And he opposed slavery and was involved in the development of an anti-slavery society in Lowell, but at the same time, when his workers tried to oppose the harsh labor laws and controls on workers by striking or demanding better wages or safer work, he would fire them. 
<laughs> and so, you know, the city, which again, like as a teacher, right, it's like, yeah. man, like what a place to be able to, like yes. you've got all of this stuff. So much happening right, right here. And you also <laughs> have, I mean, the, one of the strongest elements of the abolitionist movement in Lowell mm. are its churches. Yes. And they were part of the Underground Railroad, too, St. Right? Anne's Church, yeah. a famous, I mean, anybody that's, n that's from Greater Lowell knows St. Anne's Church sitting, this beautiful stone church sitting on Merrimack Street. Yes. Theodore Edson, its minister, was the first president of the Lowell Anti-Slavery Society. Boom. And <laughs> the church itself was a stop on the Underground Railroad. There was a place for people to hide out. And when people came um, along, the w along the way to go north into Canada or what have you, um, Edson used to have them stay in the rectory with him, yeah. which is that cute little house next to the church. <laughs> yes. People would, you know, he, he would just, like, they w he wouldn't hide them away, like, out of sight. He would, they would stay with him in the house. I feel like so many people still don't know that. That's, it baffles, it blows my mind. Every yep. time I walk by it, I'm like, I know what happened here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. old Lowell City Hall, right across from, Mer right across from St. Anne's, which is now where Enterprise Bank is. Yeah. The up above was this meeting room that wow. basically where anti-slavery meetings were held. They used to have every year a Christmas bazaar wow. where women would cook and bake and sew and like a gigantic town yeah. tag sale. But all the proceeds went to support the Underground Railroad. Wow. wow. Every bit of the money that was raised went, you know, went for that particular purpose. Huntington Hall which no longer stands, but over, again, sort of along Dutton, where for people that know the area, the giant train is. Yeah. And there's an archway there of just like a wall, and it looks kind of curious, why is this wall there? <laughs> well, that was where the tr a train station had been back in the day, and above that was Huntington Hall, this gigantic meeting place. And so people like Frederick Douglass yeah. spoke there all the time. That was a place for big New England-wide Massachusetts wide anti-slavery conventions and so that whole little area right there that we're talking about you know everything was happening um, all in that particular area um, but the churches St. Paul's Church where UTech is now is yeah. a major abolitionist church I mean and I would I, I would think the city would want to tell that history yeah would like want to have signage and markers Frederick exactly. Douglass was here that's that's something to be proud about, right? <laughs> I would think. I would think. Oh um, boy. And particularly now in the 21st century. Yeah. We were arguing about Confederate statues and whatnot. But look at us. This is what we did here. Yeah. Like yeah. why wouldn't you? Why didn't we, you know? Again, but so here we are. Yes. Wow. We talked about so much, and I feel like this time always flies. We're and done. I, yeah. <laughs> we're, we've got a wrap, but. I feel like it, it, it always comes back to the same thing. Learn your history, right? Mm. And keep digging for more because what we're told is not necessarily what the actual whole story yeah, is. What we get is about this sort of stress. So think yes. of an iceberg. Yes. Right? Oh, the vast majority of that iceberg is under the water. Yes. As the Titanic people knew. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's so bad. <laughs> But I know I'm that was so bad. grateful <laughs> for people like you who are doing this work because otherwise, what would what would we have except for the mills, right? And we wouldn't know about that that link, mm -hmm. and we wouldn't know about all of this other stuff that we need to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's vital to where we are right now as a as a as a nation to not exactly. understand that history gets us into child separations at the border and all the other sort of stuff that yes. we're that's that we're confronted with every day in the newspaper, the re-rise exactly. of white supremacy all these things, right? I mean, yeah. they have their origins in this earlier history, and to not know it and understand it makes it difficult to understand and try to figure out what do we do now. Exactly. It, it just, it just, it seems like an aberration um, or something that, well, it'll just go away. It's always been there. Exactly. Sometimes it's up here and sometimes it's subterranean, mm -hmm. but it's there. And yes. we need to understand better sort of all of that history if we're going to get better as a people. Yes. And I don't think I can put it any better than what you just said. Gee, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Bob, for this. I, uh, there's so much more that we're probably going to talk about <laughs> later. And thank you all for tuning in. I hope you learned something today on History and Lowell. <laughs>